So I was trying to introduce uh, very briefly. Uh, I think I we lost. Uh, uh, so there has been a lot of changes. I was trying to say in, in the financial sectors, the zone resilience, the government's uh, regulatory forbearance has helped. Uh, but I say the real is yet to unfold. Uh, so I, I, without further ado, yes, I think yes. I, I would uh, hand it over to you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak. So it's like this. Uh, about uh, 40 minutes, he would speak, and, uh, yes, uh, and, and then everybody uh, would be left, uh, would be open for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pradhan. Um, I'm grateful to Professor Pradhan, faculty members, and students of XLRA Jamshedpur for having me with you on this important occasion. I am aware that XLRA is a leading institution. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be associated with this kind of a eminent, preeminent institution. So what I, uh, Professor Pradhan has been very kind to give me 40 minutes. I'll try to stick to the time schedule. Uh, let me try to place things in a proper historical and comparative perspective. Uh, so uh, uh, right now we have, uh, in the last five, six, eight years, what we've seen is there has been some kind of a triple whammy, starting with the demonetization, the rolling out of the goods and services tax, and finally the COVID-19. Uh, Professor Prasad uh, has already given some kind of introduction, but uh, just to highlight the gravity, the enormity of the kind of challenge you face is that uh, there have been a lot of work carried out by the World Bank, the IMF, ADB, different central banks, government agencies, and uh, this COVID-19 has often been compared to be the Great Depression of 1929 and even the global financial crisis of October 2008. But there seems to be a consensus across the board that the severity, the magnitude, and the enormity of the challenge that we face this time is far more severe. Uh, <coughs> some more sectors have been hit. As most of us are aware, Indian economies went into a recessionary phase. Last year, we ended with uh, a GDP contraction of 7.3%, shrinkage of 7.3%. And those of you who have been tracking the macroeconomy for some time would be aware that uh, this was the first such contraction post-independence uh, uh, since 1978. So first time in a well over 40 years, we have a contraction. So this is the kind of macroeconomic challenge that we face today. While most sectors have been hit, those sectors which are more contact intensive, sectors like aviation, sectors like MSMEs, tourism, logistic, obviously they have borne the brunt of this uh, macroeconomic shrinkage or contraction. Uh, if you look at the position of the Indian economy for the last possibly 20, 30, 40 years, what we find is that basically there are four goal growth drivers of the Indian economy domestic consumption, government expenditure, private investment, and exports. So this is in line with the kind of pattern we find in most of the countries, whether you look at the IMF or the World Bank data set for about 200 countries. So all these four engines are limping at the moment. Uh, there has been uh, revenue compression also for the government because their sources of revenue have dried up, tax revenues have got squeezed, and unemployment has mounted. Uh, so all this uh, makes for um, a very grim macroeconomic backdrop. Now coming to the banking and the financial sector, against this background backdrop, the government of India and the Reserve Bank of India acting in unison have initiated a series of measures um, to reduce the misery, to reduce um, the difficulties uh, caused by uh, the hit to lives and livelihoods by the COVID-19. Uh, but there have been, I think we'll come to that later in a minute also. What you find is that in banks, there have been some cases of large scale cases, despite prodding both by the Central Bank of India and the government of India, large instances of risk, what we call risk aversion. Why there is risk aversion to this extent? Possibly would come in a, a minute later, but I wanted to highlight the issue of risk reversion 
particularly in the context of surplus liquidity, which banks have uh, at the moment. Uh, if you look at uh, one measure of the kind of surplus liquidity, which you find in the banking industry today, is can be seen from the fact that the amount of money parked in the reverse repo window of the Reserve Bank of India. Now, again, there would be day-to-day -day variation period, but broadly, if you do some kind of, uh, all of you are ex um, specializing in finance, so you'd be aware of the significance of a trend analysis, uh, data plotting over a time series. So if you look at the position in the last possibly six, eight months, what you find is that there have been huge surplus parked in the reverse repo. And obviously this will vary from day to day, from quarter end to other peers. But on an average, you can say something of the order of five and a half to even eight, eight and a half lakh crores have been parked. So this is a huge uh, surplus, which has been parked by the commercial banks within the reverse repo window of the reserve bank. Another aspect. On one side, we have surplus in the banking liquidity. And, by, and the other side of the picture is that uh, several important sectors continue to be credit starved uh, because of this kind of a rising risk reversion, which has been triggered by both demand and supply side shocks, diminished consumer confidence, mounting NPAs, and uh, consequently pronounced risk aversion. Now, uh, in any discussion, of the banking and financial sector, the issue of NPAs, non-performing assets, delinquent loans and uh, assets comes to the fore. So uh, in the last, uh, I think five, six years, the government of India has taken coordinated and concerted measures with a sense of urgency. And uh, like uh, there's a tendency to give catchy uh, phrases. So here the uh, government of India's NPA strategy has focused on what they call four R's. These R's uh, relate to resolution, recapitalization, recognition, and reforms. Now, there seems to, uh, 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 perhaps um, I may be justified in saying that perhaps the worst is over. This thesis in respect of the NPA portfolio, the banks, uh, this thesis can be substantiated by the fact that the total NPAs of the banking system, what we call the scheduled commercial banks, that means those banks which are listed in the second schedule of the RBI Act 1934, this dropped from a level of 10,36,187 crore as on March 18 to rupees 8,8,799 crore as at September 2020. Most of you would be aware that the banking sector, there are some data constraints that the latest data is not available. We don't have data for March 21 because the data is always available with some kind of a lag. So September 2020 is the latest data. So this shows a very welcome trend. But here, I would like to sound a note of caution in the sense that uh, this may not uh, convey the complete and the absolute like a uh, uh, balance sheet uh, we put out either that this can give us a true and fair picture. In case of NPA, what I've given you is the broader macro level uh, uh, picture. But as they say in English language, the devil lies in the detail. And here what happens is the NPAs are not uniform either across bank groups or across sectors. As a, again, there may be some notable exceptions, but by and large, the NPAs of the public sector banks are usually at a much higher level, whether you look at the absolute amounts, percentage total loans and advances, percentage total uh, assets, or even in terms of the conventional measures of gross non-performing assets and net non-performing assets. Uh, another aspect of the NPA portfolio is that uh, I think Professor Pradhan mentioned in his introductory remarks also that a huge uh, number of uh, bank loans, both in terms of loan accounts, number of loan accounts and amount involved. Uh, in terms of amount involved, uh, there, we have done some kind of a back of envelope calculations and these reveal that about 6% of the outstanding loans advances were restructured. So here there could be some more uh, cause for concern. Now, uh, 
uh, as I said, obviously the NPAs have declined over a period of one, one and a half years. But why have the NPAs surged? There are several reasons, both at the level of systemic uh, uh, problems uh, for the system and also at the level of individual constituents. Obviously, at the systemic level, at the macroeconomic level, the most important issue is that of uh, macroeconomic slowdown. Whenever you go into some kind of a macroeconomic slowdown, whenever they are, and even going beyond that, we had a recessionary conditions in the economy, recession being defined as uh, two successive quarters of negative GDP growth, GDP contraction, GDP shrinkage. So when you have this kind of a macroeconomic uh, position, obviously this will find some kind of a reflection, some kind of impact on the banking sector. Apart from that, there have been a stronger analysis done at the level of various agencies, individual cross-country analysis also, that in sectors where there is high growth in particular periods, these are invariably uh, uh, followed by a spike in NPAs. There has been some kind of a dilution of credit quality. Unfortunate aspect is that frauds, uh, misappropriations, embezzlements have also risen significantly. And uh, again, these are due to various reasons. Uh, some of it lies at the end of the ba banks because of faulty credit appraisal, um, deficiencies in monitoring and supervision, uh, something uh, faulty documentation, but uh, there could be some, in some cases, um, unfortunate aspects of collusion between the bank and the borrower. In the last, uh, I think, three, four years, the Indian banking industry have been in the news for all the wrong reasons. Cases such as those of Vijay Malia, Mehul Choksi, Neera Modi, uh, Deccan Chronicle. So many cases, high profile cases have come to the limelight and they have brought a bad name to the banking industry. Now, uh, if we look at the structural position of the banking sector, one very important aspect of the banking sector structural change relates to the enactment of the insolvency and bankruptcy code of 2016. Now here, I would just uh, in a lighter vein, what I'd like to submit to other distinguished uh, participants to this uh, webinar is, that unlike the situation in the United States of America or even in the Western countries, uh, we in India for the last 40 years till 2016 faced a very peculiar situation in the sense that whenever there is a spike in NPAs, the loan account went bad, the unit went bad, the company went, but the borrower never fell uh, sick. The company fell sick. The, what the borrower is to use to do is taking all the time by evergreening, by some other mechanism, uh, is that he will close shop by one name, ABC Consultants, and open another shop in the name of XYZ. So this kind of a thing, that only the company or the unit falling sick, not the borrower, this was an important uh, differentiating factors which uh, differentiated the Indian banking and the financial sector from the position in other countries. In, in, for example, in countries like the USA, if you default, they will make your life miserable. You have hell to pay. So on, uh, this is a very established uh, requirement. One of the canons of banking is that uh, the repayment cycle has to move in a proper fashion. If the banks are here to lend, then the money should be properly recycled. It should keep coming back to the bank in terms of the repayment. Otherwise, the entire cycle will get choked and banks will not be in a position to do any further lending. So in this connection, a very important landmark uh, development was the enactment of the Banking uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016. Now, this brought about a paradigm shift uh, from recovery to resolution and liquidation. There was a large number of laws uh, all this was subsumed into a comprehensive code. Earlier, uh, bankers used to be uh, reactive. Now this act made them proactive. Earlier, the debtor was in control. We moved to a situation of greater in control. There were no strict timelines here, as you know, 180 days timeline, then further 90 days. So in any case, 270 days, you can expect some kind of a 
resolution, the uh, uh, individual interest, to, we have moved to a situation of balancing interest. And earlier, the, the crown dues, the sovereign dues were given higher priority, but now in terms of the IBC, the crown dues are uh, not given so much of priority. Now, if you look at the traditional mechanisms, DRT, surface C, and all that, and all this data is easily available in a large number of publications. For example, economic survey published by the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, that is placed on the floor of parliament on the day preceding the presentation of the union budget by the Honorable Finance Minister on the floor of the parliament. And is a very comprehensive publication, which I'd like to draw attention is the trends in progress of banking in India. So all these, uh, figures keep coming that uh, whether you look at DRT, whether you look at surface, which was a monumental achievement when it was um, uh, enacted, but over a period of time, it seemed to have lost its teeth, lost its um, uh, deterrence effect to a certain extent. So if you compare the recovery from this um, innovative IBC mechanisms, uh, the data clearly bores out that while the IBC may not have entirely met the expectations it marks a significant and a discernible improvement over the conventional measures. Now, uh, uh, as I said earlier, from March 2020, we have been uh, seeing a phases of repeated uh, repo rate reductions, reverse repo, but banks have still not uh, been sufficiently induced uh, to do lending on the kind of the kind of scale that is required. So why are banks risk averse? Maybe some of you may recall that about um, possibly 10, 12 years back, one of the deputy governors of um, the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Rakesh Bhan, subsequently went to the IMF also. He came up with a phrase, with a very catchy phrase called lazy banking. That means uh, if you look at the Banking Regulation Act, the basic purpose of fundamental raising the extra purpose of existence of a banking system in India has to be accepting deposits, mobilizing deposits for the purpose of lending. So here what happens is in case of lazy banking in terms of heightened risk aversion is that banks mobilize deposits, but um, a significant proportion of it uh, goes in mm, to be parked in GSEX, a government securities, which is not proper banking at all. Now, why do we see this element of risk aversion? This is quite a complex and uh, multi-layered you know, issue and it defies a simplistic and a naive solution. Uh, I referred to the issue of risk aversion earlier also. Here, um, from the banker side, having seen the system from both sides of the table, from the side of the bankers, also from the side of the customers also. So what you find is that in case of banks, there is some kind of a justified fear of what they call fear of four C's. By four C's, I mean the Central Bureau of Investigation, Central Vigilance Commission, Central Information Commission, and also the courts. Now, um, what has made the situation much worse in this post-pandemic period is the issue of weak demand, pending wages, economic uncertainty. Overall, if you look at the position in the larger banking industry, sometimes also called the position in terms of the Reserve Bank of India, semantics uh, position in the scheduled commercial banks, is that uh, they are, we are today faced with four or five basic issues. These relate to modest capital buffers for most, especially for most public sector banks, mounting MPAs, higher credit costs, weaker earnings because of interest reversals which took place in the post-pandemic period, lower fee income and subdued growth prospects. Again, I would like to stress what I said in the case of NPs also that uh, when we refer, uh, it is common to come, common place to use this expression like the banking industry or the position financial performance in terms of scheduled commercial banks. But then it has to be realized that SCBs, 
or the banking industry taken together is not a monolithic category and there are significant differences across public sector and private sector banks and even within these groups there are very significant and considerable differences if i were to take some kind of a broad brush approach uh, i think we have to say that on the whole by and large private sector banks are better placed uh, to withstand post pandemic challenges now uh, one aspect of the banking sector which um, uh, if we look uh, to the structural aspect is that again like the npa this has often been debated is the transmission mechanism uh, the rbi has repeatedly make it made it clear now they follow the bi monthly policy data driven evidence based approach so it is by and large easy to uh, guess what kind of policy stands whether it would be accommodative or neutral or whether there will be a repo cut or not so rbi has repeatedly made it clear that uh, the repo rate has emerged as some kind of a signaling mechanism now till about 4 5 years back what used to be what used to happen is especially in case of successive rate cuts is that these rate cuts were not transmitted to the ultimate borrowers if you do some kind of analysis across banks uh, whether public sector or private sector or even the larger banking industry we found that on an average usually about 30 to 40% of the rate cut affected by the reserve bank of india used to be passed on uh, to the ultimate beneficiary at the level of the borrower thankfully this kind of a situation has changed post pandemic if you look at successive rate cuts affected by the reserve bank of india since march 2020 we did some kind of analysis and we find that about uh, 75% again there could be some individual bank wise variation but 70 to 75% of the rate cuts affected by the reserve bank of india in terms of the signaling mechanism the repo rate has been transmitted to the banking system now here there are two conflicting thoughts i'd like to submit to you for your consideration <coughs> that uh, there is considerable pressure on the banks to consistently lower the rate of interest on loans and advances but uh, as you do um, most of us are aware banks are not in this business of lending or de mobilizing deposits for the purposes of charity at the end of the day the banks are a commercial entity they have to be viable they have to be stand on their feet so it has to be realized that if there has to be a consistent pressure on lowering the interest rates again and again in case of loans and advances this will also have some kind of a concomitant attendant implications also on the depositors side so if banks lower the rate of interest on loans and advances obviously this will also have to be matched by competing cuts in the rate of interest for deposits now here there are some wider issue there been large number of complaints by pensioners fixed income groups who have no other sources other than bank deposits they have represented but maybe they do not constitute the kind of a uh, lobby the kind of pressure group which uh, for example um, lenders uh, they have organized forums like phd chamber of commerce fiki sogem uh, so many lenders groups are there so unfortunately depositors do not constitute and another problem uh, a structural problem which banks faces that uh, if they reduce rate of interest uh, beyond a point beyond a threshold level in case of deposits uh, there are some government instruments like kvc kisan vikas patra uh, national saving certificates all these are established instruments for last possibly so Uh, if the difference is only modest maybe 30 basis points or so 40 deposits will not flow from one instrument from bank deposits to these competing instruments but let us say if the deposits uh, the differential in case of bank deposits and these instruments is too much let us say 1% or more then there is a real fear so this causes some kind of a dilemma any there is structural aspect of the functioning of the banks in particular in the last 3 years 
which has been increasingly come to the fore is that the banks are confronted with a situation of falling revenues because as i said earlier uh, their uh, yield on advances has gone down their uh, nims have a net interest margin which reflects uh, the interest you pay on deposits and the interest you get on loans and advances so that is some kind of a summary indicators that have also shown some kind of a subdued trend moratorium on loans and advances has hurt the bank's cash flow now i think uh, i have and the 5 7 minutes so i'll try to round it off now in this kind of a new normal uh, where do we go from here now uh, Uh, in several respects, uh, it is widely agreed that the COVID-19 will have an enduring impact because of the kind of devastation caused, kind of a hit caused to lives and livelihoods. Uh, one aspect which I'd like to highlight in the case of banks and financial sector is that the fintech in India will become increasingly important in this, and there are already established players such as Paytm, Mobi Bank, Free Charge. bank bazaar etc so here banks are per force will in need required to transform adopt become more tech savvy but then uh, the flip side is that uh, if you go there without adequate precautions without adequate safeguards there could be issues of consumer protection frauds misappropriation so a lot of cyber frauds are coming to the fore every day so cyber security emerges as a major concern now here i'd like to draw attention to a lot of very important work which has been done across the countries uh, on the banking and financial sector uh, on the banking and financial sector is the fact that um, uh, uh, that uh, um, but the uh, world economic forum has uh, come out with a list of eight or 10 industries which are likely to be severely disrupted in a very comprehensive cross country uh, cross sectoral study and they have found that uh, the banking and the financial sector is uh, one of the top 3 4 industries likely to be severely disrupted when i see severely disrupted the kind of changes we are talking about here are not incremental changes we are talking of disruptive changes the changes are in the nature of being a game changer revolutionary kind of changes and these changes are likely to be so uh, sweeping in their scope that it uh, sometimes there's a very powerful phrase which has come in the public domain is that uh, while banking will remain it is not certain that banks will remain so this is the kind of challenge obviously banks have to go um, uh, at an accelerated speed on the technology front but then with adequate safeguard because cyber security is a very important concern in this kind of a new landscape uh, learning, uh, learning uh, has to be the new credo and what we see is that uh, uh, now three kinds of banking segments both in the public private sector likely to emerge one is future ready banks uh, which are uh, fully equipped in terms of their technological process automation uh, customer uh, tech savvy uh, closeness proximity to customers but here the issues of kyc know your customer um, anti money laundering cyber security are going to be quite critical uh, digital sub uh, laggard banks will need to evolve and renew and the persisting digital laggards banks will struggle to survive now uh, uh, no. uh, <laughs> can you unmute your mic please sam kas uh, let me come to my concluding remarks the writing on the wall is clear the message of history unmistakable the world news new uh, ways of thinking about finance and the risk it entails indian banks and financial institutions can no longer exist uh, in some kind of a cocoon or adopt an ostrich like attitude uh, but 
uh, while moving at a fast pace ahead, uh, they cannot afford to be oblivious of safeguards. Uh, these are truly difficult times, but all this necessitate recalibrated strategies and change of focus on the parts of the banking system in India. I am reminded of a very powerful sentence by Dostoevsky, a French novelist, widely recognized all over the world. I think this sentence is from his novel, Crime and Punishment, considered to be a monumental work down through the centuries, where he wrote, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. Similarly, P.B. Shelley, a very famous English poet wrote, uh, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? So these are difficult times. The tunnel may be long and difficult, but I'm confident that with a kind of dynamism and resilience, the Indian banking has shown will be equal to the challenge, will be able to surmount all these difficulties and emerge much stronger in the days ahead. We shall overcome. As the Holy Bible says, this too shall pass. Hum honge kamyab. So let me close on this positive and optimistic note. Thank you all for being for having me with uh, here with all of you. Once again, thankful to Professor Prashad, uh, his distinguished faculty members, and the students of this preeminent institution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sarma. Thank you very much for almost laying a canvas of the entire canvas of the banking sector and, uh, and, and several, uh, several critical areas highlighting the, uh, the underlying, uh, you know, the implications of pandemic and uh, including uh, even the prospective problems that the banking sector. Uh, I think there are several questions. Uh, I, I would uh, probably keep my one or two observations to the end, but uh, there are several questions have been raised. And uh, can I, Dr. Sava, ask a couple of questions raised by uh, the yes, audience? Sir, uh, please, sir, go ahead, sir. You see, this is one first question is by Professor Pankaj Agarwal. He says that the bad bank incorporated recently, can it lead to moral hazard for the banks? I mean, you know, I think if I, uh, I, I say so that, you see, I think, will the bank be responsible for the lending they have done? Will they be more, uh, you know, carefree? I mean, if, if things goes bad, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, I, I, you know, they, 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 they toss a coin, which Paul Krugman said once, that had I win, tell you lose. I mean, is that the situation we are getting into? Sir, so this is a difficult question. This is a very, you know, traditionally it has been say, um, maintained in the banking sector that if you form a separate bad bank, if the bad loans are separately parceled out, diced, sliced, sent to other specialized unit, maybe they will have focus attention to devote on this kind of a thing. But then this is its other you know, flip side implications is that maybe as you rightly say, the banks, uh, traditionally, what happened is the bank branch, who, which was involved in lending, was also involved in recovery. So here, lending will be done by someone, recovery will be done by someone. So maybe this could lead to some kind of a dichotomy. These are early days, but this bank, uh, specialized bank banking model, has worked well in several countries. These are, but then here, uh, they are, this is a very complex issue. What kind of haircut? There is the issue of security deposits, whether they will get in cash or in some kind of a security deposit. What would be the timelines for this kind of a thing? What is the kind of a resolution we are looking at? What kind of a percentage are the bad banks likely to recover? How much of it will be shared between the original banks? So all these something are work in progress. These are issues which are being care carefully watched and monitored. So I think it's maybe too early to take a call, but then uh, since the earlier system did not work well, it is, uh, I think, important to keep on innovating. And this marks an important, uh, the creation of bad banks in India, asset recovery companies, what we call, it marks an important innovation. I think it would be premature on our part to come to some kind of a hasty judgment. Let us wait and watch for some time how the system works, because in these kind of things, uh, uh, there is also a very important com concept, like when you build a house before moving it, there can be last, so mid-course correction. 
So uh, as uh, one gets used to this kind of a new and innovative system, maybe there could be some more fine tuning, maybe there could be some more tweaking and uh, we learn as we go along. So possibly let us wait uh, and watch for some time before coming to a firm conclusion on the efficacy, on the effectiveness of the bad banking system in India. No, thank you. I think uh, uh, something related to this, Utsav asked a question that, how would the role and impact of bad bank be different from that of asset reconstruction companies? I think you have answered rightly. It is evolving. It's more, I think more or less the role would be, I suppose, similar, right? Yes, uh, uh, so there is another question, uh, uh, which is uh, on moratorium. Now, uh, this Niles is asking, Niles Neal, uh, does moratorium impact the total NPA amount? I think it's, an, uh, if, I, if I suppose that uh, the, the moment you have a moratorium, uh, I think then all, all of these uh, the, the dues are, are, are delayed. Now, he's asking whether it is adjusting the amount of NPS. Would it go up post moratorium? Uh, uh, Say so the flip side is uh, moratorium. What happens is, for example, if you take the position as on 31st March 2020, all loans were the standard as on that date. Uh, moratorium was given that uh, because of uh, maybe the choking of the trade cycle, the payment schedule was not observed the government of India, RBA, extended this moratorium facility. But what has happened is uh, 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 that traditionally what we have found is that once these moratorium benefits go, there is a tendency to spike. So uh, this is borne out by data published by the Reserve Bank of India, government of India, also anecdotal data by various banks. So these kind of things uh, keep happening. So. By and large, it is expected, but then banks are also likely to streamline their recovery mechanism, provide focus attention. So hopefully uh, this should not come to pass, but then there is a real and a persisting danger that uh, post moratorium, uh, especially in the accounts which were extended this facility, there is a real and a persisting danger that maybe NPS could spike. All banks are aware of this um, issue, even at the level of IBA, all banks come together and Reserve Bank of India. So there have been a lot of focus attempts uh, so that the NPA does not spike. So I think uh, in some cases, what you find is there could be some rise, but not the kind of spike which was feared earlier. So, okay, so is that, that is that the indication? I think you also observed 6% only went opted for restructuring. And that so such a low uh, percentage of borrowers loan accounts went for uh, you know opted for restructuring so is, is there something to do with that i mean is it giving a good signaling that okay you are you are not really that bad <clears throat> no sir but, uh, i don't remember all the details but uh, when the moratorium scheme was it was subject to a large number of conditionalities and conditions so mainly broad like for example if you look at the traditional loan book of a banking system in India or a, any individual bank. Broadly speaking, there would be four components to the loan book. One is agriculture, the other would be MSME, the third would be retail lending, the fourth would be um, a large corporate advances, prime corporate advances. So broadly, these are the four important components. So these cases, uh, moratorium cases, mainly apply to the segment called MSMEs micro, small, and medium enterprises. So uh, uh, this did not have a great deal of applicability in case of agriculture, in the case of... Uh, so this benefit was a kind of a focus attempts were made. So to that extent, a um, uh, um, lot of other sectors and segments were not eligible. So these were the focus attempts made. So I think 6%, even in absolute terms, is a fairly large uh, uh, sum for the Indian banking system. Okay, but, but MSME sector has been extremely hard. I mean, that is the sector. And I think, uh, I think one doesn't know, once the moratorium is lifted, how will that sector, uh, because they're almost, for, uh, they haven't done to been respond, and even uh, post second wave, there's a huge recovery problems. Uh, which, uh, now, uh, there's another question related to this transmission. 
now he asked uh, delphi asked a question that uh, how can rbi ensure you know that the, the de decrease in repo rate be transmitted to the borrowers in terms of lower interest rates and i think similar questions uh, pavitra dr pavitra kumar jena he asked that is there any other way like you know uh, uh, that monetary transmission uh, can work better than the traditional modes and i think i understand pavitra is working on transmission mechanism uh, you could come actually comment pavitra if you have something uh, in mind uh, but uh, but you know the, is there any other way no, no other forms of transmission mechanism uh, you know uh, I, i mean you don't expect the rbi to uh, keep calling banks that cut the interest rates every day i think there must be some some you know uh, ways of uh, ways and means so uh, would you comment on this uh, uh, and and i i personally feel that this uh, uh, risk aversion and lower transmission and i think they play a very important role in credit offtake and mm -hmm. the, the there is a significant risk aversion the banks are investing a large sum of money in holding government securities i suppose their total holding is around 33% of the government securities in the industry and uh, uh, so therefore uh, and, and and putting money in the reverse repo as you know we already pointed it out that that Uh, so therefore is there a way in which uh, i think we to come out of this uh, there is one argument i hear in the press that once they slightly raise the reverse repo rate you know uh, i think the corridor is reduced uh, that might ease up a little bit of this tension uh, so uh, would you would you little reflect on this so but it, it's really very nice you made a very important point of risk aversion and that is uh, that is prolonged uh even in the uh, prior to pandemic even now and i think post pandemic this might be even further deepen uh so i think i'll take the first question first uh, risk aversion we have already dealt with so uh, let me come to the issue of transmission mechanism i would like to respond to the issue of transmission mechanism at two levels one at the level of theory and the second is at the level of functions and working of commercial banking system in india now at the level of theory post economic reforms started in india in bright earnestness since 19 banks are supposed to be uh, free to take their autonomous uh, you keep here if you do a google search in case of indian banking you will repeated that banks are autonomous they are free to take their own decisions so this kind of a dictate coming either from the regulator or for, from the part of the government of india which is the apart from the government is also a majority uh, equity holder in most public sector banks well over 50% so this will go against the spirit if not the law of uh, economic reforms at the theoretical level that is the problem the second aspect is that all banks um, I, i was part of a i was part of kendra bank for about 17 18 years at a fairly senior level and all banks have a institutionalized system of uh, alco meetings asset liability committee meetings where the issues of uh, liability mix uh, uh, assets duration of assets duration of liabilities these issues of asset liability mismatches are carefully dealt with what is the uh, cost of deposits what is the cost of other borrowings what is the yield on advances uh, what is the return on investments so what is the spread that the banking so each bank has to take an individual call so there so given this kind of complex issue both at the level of theory and at the level of functions and uh, practice of the banking system it may not be fair to accept one to one correspondent uh, to simplify it if the rbi reduces by 100 basis you cannot expect the banks to reduce uh, banks by and large will go in that direction but uh, it may not be fair because of a variety of reasons uh, for banks to fall in line but here i think uh, i'd like to draw attention to the fact that even earlier also uh, in my talk i tried to highlight that if you take the post pandemic period as a point of reference as a benchmark uh, period you'll find that the level of transmission post pandemic has significantly improved for example if you compare it to the let us say 2000 about 7 8 years back 
conventionally the transmission used to happen to the extent of 30 40 percent now it is happening to the extent of 70 75 so beyond that it may not be fair to accept uh, expect the kind of changes because banks have to take their decision on the basis of their asset liability mismatches, on the basis of cost of funds, on the level of casa deposits, on the level of high yielding advances, on the composition of retail. So it's a very complex and a diversified issue, and uh, it may not be uh, proper to uh, say that one size fits all. One size does not fit all. Broad brush approach, may some kind of a granular approach as is being done for the last uh, so many years. I think that may be the proper way to go about things. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Very, very uh, clearly you have articulated, Dr. Suma. There is one question which I think an area where uh, uh, you have been, uh, I have seen your observation, uh, uh, brief write-up I have seen. You know, this uh, consolidation and merger. And uh, so the so question is uh, asked by Sasank. Uh, that uh, I, I mean, should India believe in the uh, too big to fail argument? Uh, now, because we are now in the merger, you know, they were consolidating the banking system, the, num the number of PSU banks. Now, what care should be taken? Um, thank you, for, um, Professor Pishal, for a very interesting and uh, uh, um, contextually significant question. As you're aware, in the last uh, Five, seven years, so we have seen a wave earlier. The, the State Bank of India had seven, eight subsidiaries, all of them folded. The State Bank became even earlier, it was a big institution. Now it has become some kind of a mega institution. Yeah. Um, PSB last year, we have seen a wave of mergers. Now, all this has combined to reduce um, the number of public sector banks, which were 27 till about, for, let us say, five years back. This has drastically shrunk to 12 banks in the public sector. Now, what are the reasons? Why should we go? Uh, so there are very important economies of scale, economies of scope. I, even otherwise, I'd like uh, all your students to go through a very important publication, which is published from London. I think it is brought out in July every year, a regular publication for the last uh, uh, possibly 40, 50 years. Uh, the Banker, it's called The Banker, published from London. Uh, Till about five, seven years back, okay. you, uh, if you look at the uh, ranking of uh, bankers, <clears throat> of banks across the world is, you did not find even a single bank in the top 100. So maybe uh, it was felt that uh, if the economies of scale, if the economies of uh, scope, size and muscle have to be leveraged, banks have to uh, acquire size and muscle, consolidation is necessary. But the issue of safeguards, the issue of taking proper precautions is very necessary. Because here, what I'd like to draw attention, uh, there have been a wave of mergers in Germany, across the world, so many countries. And the international evidence, I think I've written some papers for the Hindu I wrote about uh, 10 years ago, even for some international journals also. So the scope of uh, uh, the, this kind of analysis of mergers all over the world, that the evidence is mixed. Uh, this is not an unmixed blessing. In some cases, it, this has led to great success. In other cases, it has not been so successful. So on that kind of a basis, a uh, lot of, I would say, submit that a uh, lot of preparatory work is needed in terms of technology platforms, in terms of HR cultures, in terms of uh, um, uh, banks adopting the same kind of systems and procedures so that there's some kind of a synergy. I think I wrote one sentence for, it was, I think, for the Hindu about 10 years back. I think um, a slightly catchy expression, uh, it was discussed, debated at, all over the world, that if you do not take proper precautions uh, before going in for mergers, it can be a case of marrying in haste and repenting at leisure. So uh, you should do your, all your due diligence prior to marriage. Otherwise, you are stuck up with a bad partner and you're forced to repent for life. So similarly, when different partners, different institutions are coming together, this kind of a due diligence, this kind of a huge homework is necessary to see that 
both the banks. I am happy to note that in the kind of uh, mergers that have been effected, uh, technically they have not called mergers, and they are now called amalgamations. In the last one year, uh, all the banks which have been amalgamated together, they are on the same technology platforms. By and large, their HR culture is also similar. But this is something in which you have to keep doing mid-course corrections, whatever problems occur. So this is a very complex issue. And um, it has to be understood that I think that sentence also became a great hit that uh, I wrote, I think, sometime in 2004 or five. Uh, uh, that the banks, uh, banking consolidations, mergers and acquisition or amalgam, this should not be seen as some kind of a panacea, as some kind of a ramban that it will remove all ills of the banking system. It would be clearly unrealistic to expect that mergers and acquisitions, amalgamations, consolidation in the banking system could work as some kind of a panacea. This could be an important step going forward, but the issues of NPA, the issue of a liability and asset mix, the issue of viability, the issue of profits and profitability, the issue of uh, shifting to the digital mode, using technology as a catalyst for recovery, payment scenario, all these have to be important parts of the overall uh, banking strategic transformation and growth. So this is an important part of the story. Uh, mergers and acquisition or amalgamation. This is not the entire story by itself. So this is one element, not the complete story. So that would be my submission. Okay. Oh, no, that is it. Uh, yeah. So Professor uh, Tripathi, uh, Dilotan Tripathi, a uh, senior professor in finance area, uh, let me introduce. So I will invite Professor Tripathi to make his observations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarma, it's a nice presentation, but uh, the question remains: you No, know, whether uh, the assumptions of two of the the consolidation, no, whenever we are going to go for consolidation, uh, we are making an assumption that uh, too big to fail. I think that assumption, whether it is right or wrong, in that light, if you can just throw on, uh, let's say, give some sort of idea, that's going to be interesting. Second thing is that the bank consolidation has merits and concerns as well, the right you pointed out. Going to rationalization of the bank network, there is every chance for greater efficiency, uh, pulling up treasury operations, uh, the redeployment of your large workforce, a lot of things are there, no doubt. But if you talk about the bank, bank consolidations, definitely it's having larger concerns, especially whenever you are saying too big to fail, that assumptions whenever you take. Theoretically, the, the, the collusion could uh, reflect in higher uh, markups during the bad times. Whenever you are having a big bank, no, then, then a, a very small number of banks are there. There may be some kind of your monopolization. Therefore, at bad times, it may be, let's say, at the time of your, let's say, burst of your business cycle, it may have some sort of negative impact as well. And the contrasting view could be, let's say, uh, low competitive pressures could help stabilize credit in bad times. We may also say that. But uh, over and above that, if you see that the, the kind of consolidation is happening in Indian banking space, sir, what is your idea whether public sector bank consolidation would help stabilize credit supply in bad times in India? That's my precise question. Uh, sir, your uh, this issue hypothesis of TBTF, too big to fail, this has been widely discussed. Traditionally, what you're saying is that uh, uh, was accepted as a part of the conventional wisdom all over the world is that uh, the bigger the size of the bank financial institution, the lesser chances to fall. But the fallacies inherent in this approach were, have been shown up repeatedly, most recently by the glo uh, <clears throat> global financial crisis of October 2008, where large, huge, humongous institutions failed despite being considered Lehman Brothers failed. There are so many other institutions also failed. So one aspect is too big to fail. The other is that this also increases the kind of danger, the peril it will it can cause to the economy. This uh, these kind of institutions they can cause systemic risk. Because if an institution which is labeled as too big to fail, if that institution collapses, now the financial sector, all of you who are experts here in this area are fully aware that the financial sector is increasingly become interdependent and interlinked to various other constraints. 
And if a big institution, which is identified as something like uh, too big to fail, if that fails, uh, it will have systemic um, uh, repercussions That's and right. implications across the entire financial sector because of interdependencies and interlinkages with various constraints of the financial system. Now, this has become a real danger, not just in India, across the world. And following that kind of a best practices for the last 10 years, I think perhaps you may be aware, or if you do a Google search, you'll come across that in India also, this concern has been repeatedly raised. Uh, earlier, uh, the Reserve Bank of India had um, identified, I think, 10 or 12 banks way back in 2012. Uh, in which uh, the banks were SBI, Kendra Bank, Punjab National Bank, Bank of Baroda, Bank of India, ICIC Bank, HDFC. And uh, in kind of these banks were uh, considered to be part of SIFI, systemically important financial institutions called SIFI. Uh, there, I think the usual benchmark for classifying these banks was that uh, wherever these banks, all of these banks had a share of market share in the total banking pie, in the total banking business of 4% or more. So that was the earlier benchmark. I think this concept is started in India 2010 or 11, around 2012. Now in the last seven years, uh, this concept has undergone some kind of a paradigm shift, wide ranging changes. And now we have come to a situation where we call DSIPs domestically systemically important banks and i think as per the latest definition which has been in vogue for last i think four or five years is that uh, there are three important uh, three uh, constituents of the banking uh, system in india which are part of bsips these are sbi icic bank and hdfc bank now here there's much greater regulatory rigor much greater degree of regulatory oversight in case of these banks, uh, like for uh, unlike say a Punjab and Sindh Bank or uh, uh, let us say Indian Overseas Bank for that matter, because these banks, as I said, because of the interdependencies and interlinkages, if a State Bank of India or HDFC or ICC Bank were to collapse today, the kind of devastation it will cause across all segments of the world would be huge and humongous. So the uh, one thing is that to be big to fail, TBT has its merits, but now the dangers, the kind of peril it throws up and all over the world, people are very keenly watching the performance. For example, uh, 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 let me share some anecdotal evidence because of the significance attached to this concept. I cannot name you the person, but I'm told the our regulator, Central Monetary and Banking Institution of the country, Reserve Bank of India, has at a very senior level, at the level of general manager, one officer is particularly attached to monitoring the performance of these DCIPs on a day-to-day, -day, on an intraday basis. One officer is earmarked to monitor the performance of SBI and the for ICAC, HDFC, because the kind of uh, damage uh, this uh, holds potential is huge. So we are aware of the uh, uh, mishaps that could be uh, that could happen along the way, but all of us are working together to minimize the operation risk, credit risk, market risk. Banking is all about risk taking prudent risk taking. So uh, these are evolving situations post Basel to post uh, uh, capital adequacy norms, uh, post this significance of uh, sharper focus on risk management, more greater regulatory rigor. So all these are complex things. This is an evolving situation. And the Reserve Bank of India, I'm happy to say as our regulator is fully conscious and alive to these issues. They are monitoring all these issues. Uh, on a constant real-time basis. So hopefully uh, in India, we will not come to a sorry pass. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes. I, think, I think Dr. Sharma very rightly said that it's not just the institutional reorganization, but also the umbrella of regulatory surveillance, the supporting policy design, the, the, you know, they, all of them are, I think, very nicely uh, evolving, as you rightly said, uh, Basel III, Basel compliance, uh, the risk surveillance, and I think uh, they have been evolving post 
2008 financial crisis and even now in more aptly and i think that, but at the same time i think in india we are seeing that uh, we are giving licenses to small finance banks we are converting microfinance institutions into banking institutions i think now reserve bank has on tap licenses so they even the licensing regime has become much more uh, you know the entry barriers are much easier today uh, so so i think the, uh, and i think very good question asked by lavanya prakash uh, that uh, we have now development financial institution uh for financing infrastructure and other development so at least some part of the portfolio of banking system uh, may, might shift to uh, these uh, organizations uh, so the banks will not be overburdened with you know almost every uh, development financial activities though they continue to remain uh, i think we have now this 53 years so i suppose the bank 52 years of bank nationalization this year uh and uh, they they would continue to dwell on development financing but i think it's a little bit uh, separation is happening so so very rightly dr sharma you said that the banking sector is evolving uh, with with both uh, institutional as well as the the, the prudential and regulatory uh, structure i think thank you that was very interesting point uh, any any other questions and i think there are several other questions but i think paucity of time we already have crossed any other uh, significant question anybody would like to ask pavitra wanted to make a comment, uh, observation if i want to policy i the pavitra my audible sir yes please yeah. so just i wanted to know nice to see you <laughs> yeah yeah for uh, like longer time that uh, that uh, monetary policy that effect that is not effective because if you see that repo rate and growth it was even if before covid it was actually not responding so that's why there is a debating going uh, going on in advanced country so there is a need to revisit that monetary policy transmission channel in india because dem demographic dividend is playing a major role like when you change the rate of re repo rate or the rate of the credit card rate or loan that now the digital money is playing important role so the young mass which is the major chunk of the population they are be behaving the different way compared to the like uh, that old generation that is uh, playing the important role in the like in the monetary policy so there is a there is a need to see uh, do the research how the demographic uh, uh, profile is playing the role for the effectiveness of monetary policy that's why there is a committee consulted to look at this and what like instead of this interest rate channel and exchange rate channel and this uh, digital money uh, credit rate uh, credit rate of interest that should be taken care of and the demographic profile should taken care of to make a robust uh, uh, like uh, uh, transmission channel thank you sir for opportunity uh, can i respond to your observation yes please sir uh two points so one is he raised the issue of transmission channel as um, this is an ongoing process the reserve bank of india in line with the best practices across all central banks they are constantly looking and um, all of us are aware they have a monetary policy committee constituted in which there are six members three from outside three from the reserve bank of india so this is an evolving situation maybe whatever deficiencies are highlighted uh he also referred to the point of demographic dividend there is a lot of confusion so i thought uh, since it is that issue let me clarify uh because this issue is fraught with lot of uh, confusion and not clarity some of you may be aware this concept of demographic dividend first came into public prominence i think it was in october 2004 this was a report of goldman sachs uh, uh, written by co-authored by two persons one was a us gentleman dominic williams uh, wilson and then the other was an indian lady called rupa purushottam and this dem theory of demographic dividend that india would be the largest economy by 2040 50 by 2040 we will become one of the two or three largest players this also provided to um, i think pavitra is very young but people who are 40 or 45 may remember that this also provided some kind of a theoretical foundation to the then bjp campaign they ran a campaign called india shining so this provided the theoretical justification now in case of demographic dividend uh, i think we have a tendency to uh, take shortcuts go by catchy headlines 
but I think I read it report about 20 years back, sometime in 2004, when it was published, <coughs> about 200 pages report. Now, I would like to draw attention to a very important aspect, which is sometimes glossed over, which is sometimes not given adequate attention in this all this debate and discussion about uh, demographic dividend is that towards the end of the report, they have identified, they have said that all this de demographic dividend is likely to happen in India. But at the, they have put three important riders, caveats in the case of uh, India, other kind, especially in case of India, uh, towards the end of that report, that India would be able to fully realize its demographic dividend provided. Now, in all this discussion, we tend to gloss over and not pay adequate attention to that uh, section after provided. And here they have highlighted that issues of employment, education, and health. Post-pandemic, all these issues have come into greater uh, prominence. That unless uh, these aspects are adequately taken care of, I said, in I think in a uh, international conference, I think it was carried as the headlines because it became. Otherwise, India's demographic dividend, as visualized by this Goldman's, could well become a demographic disaster unless the issues of education, health, and employment are addressed on a war footing. So. Thank Dr. you very Sama, much. I think interesting uh, question. Yeah, Dr. Sam, I think Professor Prabhupada was trying to ask a question. That, that, that is some issue with the monetary policy transmission, the channel, whatever you are using, you know. Yes. The repo rate court. That that repo rate court is not realized by the let's say depositors or the whenever the bank is lending money to let's say to the uh, your housing sector or to the business sector, they are not really getting that particular impact. The more or less the, the rate, whatever they are just charging or offering, more or less it remains a kind of freeze rate. No, it is not changing over a period of time. Therefore, there is a need uh, to look into this monetary policy transmission channel. Hence, hence RBI or maybe the policy makers, those who are in the bay, board, they are supposed to really go through it and create some mechanism by which this, uh, let's say, report rate caught or your, whether it is increasing or decreasing, that impact should be reflected at the bank end. That's not really happening in most of the cases. If you see the, let's say, till today, the, uh, let's say, housing loan rate, more or less is are above 12 to 13 percent. It remains like that, approximately 11 to 12 percent. Therefore, it's not really impacting at all, whether you are guys cutting the report rate or not. I think that was the context he was trying to say. Because now, in the today context, compared to repo rate and this credit, like credit card rate and digital money rate is becoming more in, important, more effective compared to the repo rate. So in the current scenario, that become uh, like uh, less effective. That's why I'm telling there is a need of revisiting the monetary uh, That's uh, right. policy That's right. transmission. That I wanted to know. It's not that I'm telling more population, something like that. You have to see like uh, how the younger generation, in which things that there is a more effectiveness in the younger generation. That is the debate uh, like uh, the, that I wanted to know from you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think the traditional framework of uh, transmission looks at the, how is it transmission uh, transmitted to the lending rate and lending rate for for the sectors like focus on MSME or you know or uh, even transmission. Uh, so oftentimes it's seen that whenever there is a change, probably it gets transmitted faster in the deposit rate than the lending rate. Uh, and uh, and it, it transmission takes after a time lag as well because the banks can transmit in an incremental way, not on the past, uh, you know, the past deposits and there are past loans. So only incremental cases. Uh, uh, so there are, you know, there are a lot of, I think, complex issues. And in addition to the fact that bank margins are affected by many other factors, and therefore this, this transmission may not really make the banks you know, efficient enough to completely tra transmit. But, but nevertheless, I think, uh, Dr. Sarma, I think we have almost uh, come to across 15 minutes. And uh, I must thank you. This is one of the beautiful uh, lecture with the entire canvas of the banking system in a very short period of time. Before I pass on to Professor Tripathi to put a formal vote of thanks, uh, I must thank you, Dr. Sarma, for accepting our invitation to speak to our Excel uh, faculty, students, and uh, several invitees. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, sir.
thank you prof tripathi would like to say something yes sir uh, dr sharma actually nicely you started this debate now with this discussion and with the covid 19 how this covid 19 has really impacted a lot and especially it has changed the indian banking industry space and all that subsequently you talked about your let's say how this your covid 19 has uh, really shrinked the indian gdp which is was having severe impact on this particular economy uh, since last uh, uh, 1978 and all that subsequently you talk, talked about how this covid 19 impact uh, has impacted the let's say banking in terms of let's say liquidity and its riskness risk aversion and how it has influenced your npa and your other, other uh, let's say aspects of your banking industry how it has impacted you just also touched upon that then subsequently also you talked about your let's say bank regulation act uh, why banks are more risk averse you also justified very nicely presented that idea as well and they are reducing the deposits but they are not really let's say deploying it uh, those deposits in the appropriate manner they are uh, lazy banks uh, that, that's what you termed it as and subsequently they are parking a lot of money in the gsex and all that then subsequently we were just paying attention to also let's see considerable differences among the psu and psu especially in terms of the structure and nature of the banking business then uh, uh, um, uh, subsequently you are talking about your debt cut how it is affecting closely 70 75% of the industry those who are really dependent on the banking credit and all that then uh, uh, subsequently uh, towards the end you are talking about um, this uh, banking consolidations and the recent covid 19 impact how it has reduced the revenue of the banks their net interest margin how it has declined and all that then uh, uh, very interesting the fintech how the fintech is going to play a big role in the indian banking industry space and a, how every bank has to really come up with this particular level of uh, technology technological adaptation and all that otherwise definitely they are going to be in, in a big trouble and uh, the flip side of this particular let's say fintech and your uh, artificial intelligence and all that is going to be your cyber crime or your uh, cyber frauds or consumer protection is going to be a big challenge in this context we also highlighted on that aspect then uh, um, uh, maybe uh, towards the end also we talked about let's say you some quotes you brought it from your uh, your uh, bible and all that and said that yes definitely we shall overcome the lot of challenges are there with us but if you can really work together if the rbi is going to play a big role and the regulators definitely that's going to help us out to overcome the challenges whatever we have and nicely you addressed a lot of questions very interesting actually a lot of us have learned a lot even we are into this professions but a lot of new insights you brought to the let's say platter and against this backdrop it's my pleasure to really extend heartfelt thanks from xlri and from the behalf of your let's say financial market center and we have launched this series and you just made this particular series that you are the first person the first let's say intellectual to deliver this lecture to our students and faculty members and we look forward to similar kind of your interaction with you in the future and we are extremely thankful dr sharma extremely thankful thank you so much thank you very much professor thank you for the kind words